Hello, everybody. I'm truly excited to have with me today Bill Ottman, the co-founder and CEO of Minds.com. Bill, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. Minds.com, for all of you who are not familiar, is a quickly growing social media site that basically solves all of the serious problems Facebook has with privacy and free speech. So Bill, let's start with privacy. Of course, Facebook, when they started, assured everybody that their data would be private and they had nothing to worry about. So what makes Minds.com different why could we trust you? Well, Facebook said that, but yes. you could never actually look at their code to see what it was doing. So the, the primary element of that is that all of our code is free and open source. So anyone can inspect it, modify it, fork it, make their own version, uh, comment on it, peer review. And so that's, that's the core. But additionally, Facebook, I mean... It's, they said that they would keep it safe, but they never said that they wouldn't spy on you. Um, so obviously with all the hacks, they couldn't even keep it safe. But we have an opt out by default policy. So we're not we don't ask for sensitive information. You can provide certain information if you want, for instance, um, you know, certain curations. But and that's all encrypted for sure. But we don't want more data than we need. So um, on Facebook, there's no way to stop them from following you around. So this is sort of the consent-based future that we imagine for social networks where, you know, by default, n n you're not getting spied on. And then if you want more curation, then you can opt into that if you want. I am so excited uh, about that. And it's so important. Um, People can verify it for themselves that you're not uh, spying on them. You have encrypted messaging. I think that's a slam dunk against Facebook. Now uh, we'll move on to free speech, which I agree with you completely on, but I think it is a more controversial uh, issue. So uh, what's your take on free speech at Minds.com? How is it different from Facebook? So Facebook's policy, you know, no one really knows what it is. <clears throat> Same with all the other major social networks. It's not just Facebook. They're, they pretty much all operate the same way with similar terms. So we have the policy that as long as it's legal in the U.S. and obviously no inciting violence or harassing, um, you know, it can be on the site. So that is a much more simple, digestible idea for people on Facebook and Twitter. And you, you don't know what is going to get taken down. You don't know what, you know, this offensive post is fine. This offensive post gets taken down. Totally subjective. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty much where we stand. Yeah. Um, I'm mean, just for anyone who doesn't already know, like I've had some awful experience with Facebook taking down videos of mine, ironically, videos that were exposing censorship on in the mainstream media. Um, and they gave me no notification about it. Um, <laughs> I had to find out through people who noticed that it was missing from their pages and the notification Facebook gave them was incredibly vague in general. And if you actually if, uh, look into their community standards, it, there, it is clear that it didn't violate any of them, but there was no appeals process. It's, it's a disaster. Um, and that's, that was in 2016, that's when I first uh, became aware of Minds.com. Obviously, we're having more and more issues with uh, Facebook removing pages unexplicably. Um, and so people are, again, there's another migration over to Minds.com. Um, but of course, um, in this latest uh, round of Facebook purges, their reasoning is spamming. Um, now, I don't buy it. I think people should be skeptical of it for a couple of reasons. One, primarily, all of the pages sure seem to be political. And also, they're, they don't give you any specific, legitimate, specific reason uh, why these pages were spamming. Um, considering the fact that they were, their re the reasons Facebook gave, again, general, they said they were sharing in Facebook groups and had clickbait posts. 
Okay, how the hell does any, how does, can Facebook possibly determine if it's clickbait when the entire site, everybody posting on it, the posts are designed to get clicks? And groups, the whole point of groups is sharing with people who opted in to, to see content that is relevant to the group, to the topics the group has decided. So it's absurd to me. But nevertheless, spamming is a potential problem. So how would uh, minds handle spamming or spammers? Yeah, I mean, I know some of the founders of many of those organizations that recently got banned and they're most of them are legitimate journalists in alternative media so you know i think that some of those pages may have been using some tactics that they knew could sort of amp up the reach of the post which they had just learned over the period of years because the algorithm was restricting people's reach so much. I mean, you know, five years ago on Facebook, you could actually, you know, if you had a page with a hundred thousand or a million followers, like you could drive serious traffic through that page. And now, you know, this is for personal pages and, and brand pages. You're only reaching like maybe even less than 5% of your own, your own audience organically. And then their algorithm sort of decides what is going to be successful beyond that. So they, they forced people to get into this strategy of how to get the engagement up because they took away everybody's reach in the first place. So, you know, what do they really expect when, you know, people feel pretty betrayed in the first place? I mean, at least a warning would be nice. You know, these, these pages never got any warnings, no chances. They had you know, pages with like millions, millions of followers. So yeah, the whole communication protocol is totally broken. There isn't one. Yeah, it's 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 just a big mess. And I know for a fact that many of them were not spamming. So I'm sure some were, but many, many probably just got caught up in the algorithm. And, you know, there may also be some political targeting, but you don't necessarily know that that's sort of uh, because of the complete lack of transparency. We, yeah. Because of this complete lack of transparency, sure, we don't know if it was politically motivated, but we can't. it's only fair to speculate when there's no transparency. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is that a lot of those pages were progressive. So you can't say that it was a you know, conspiracy against conservative pages. You could say that there was a general bend towards uh, censoring anti-establishment pages, but absolutely. You know, we we don't we don't know. And that, again, you're right. That that is the core problem that we don't know mm -hmm. because there's no transparency. And, and I can vouch for uh, some of these pages too. I I had uh, worked with uh, police the police. I'd had my content shared on the Free Thought Project, which, I mean, it's the same content that USA Today shared. So, I mean, these, <laughs> I can totally, so basically my point is, yes, uh, these were legitimate news sources. Um, now, yes, obviously it's important to protect free speech, but also I love your understanding of it being important to keep free speech in order to combat hate right which is yes yeah. i mean go ahead i've been doing a yeah i've been doing a lot of research on this and you know censorship tends to bring more attention to what you're trying to censor that doesn't mean that censorship can never work it often does work and it, it, especially when the most powerful communication platforms in the world start censoring things it does probably have a net negative impact on those ideas proliferating. But we know that it's like a whack-a-mole. You drown it out here, it pops up over here, it causes those trolls to become more inflamed. Um, it's even shown that it can lead to violence. I mean, it, it's, it's just pushing the problem off onto other platforms as opposed to confronting it head-on. And we know from serious experiential evidence like with uh, Daryl Davis confronted hundreds of members of the KKK, got them all to leave just through open discourse. So open discourse creates healthier societies. We know this. This is obvious. Um, so, you know, they, they don't actually care about solving the problem. If they wanted to solve the problem, they would allow a lot more content and they would frame it 
in much more of a, a serious data driven analysis on you know how to combat these ideas and you know not not just banning things that that are uncomfortable yeah um i agree completely actually made a video about daryl davis and he is not an outlier by any means there's many examples proving that you can defeat racism and bigotry by just engaging with your enemies um mm. And I, I really feel like Facebook isn't just going about, you know, attacking this, uh, this hate in the wrong way. They're actually a, a major source of the problem being exacerbated through their algorithms. Because right. their algorithms, it, it actually creates misinformation. Ironically, since they say they're, you know, they're trying to, to solve that problem. But... When you only show people material that confirms their own biases, that exacerbates misinformation, that misinforms people. When, yep. you only, when the only thing that people ever see from people they disagree with is the most extreme content, that creates misinformation. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, so... On, on Minds.com, we'll, we're never going to implement algorithms in the, in the main news feed. It'll always be raw and chronological. And, you know, it's not to say that people won't still create their own echo chambers. They will. But, you know, users should have the freedom to curate their own feed. And, you know, it's important to educate people on how to, you know, it's probably healthy to subscribe to people from, uh, both sides of the spectrum, subscribe to ideas you disagree with, create your own sort of anti-filter, anti-echo chamber. But yeah, exactly. I mean, those algorithms feed you more of what they think you're more likely to click on. And that's why they've come under fire for feeding disinfo. And, you know, then their strategy is to put a little alert on the post that, oh, this, this post is questionable according to X, Y, and Z uh, third party who, you know, don't even seem particularly good at vetting information. So, um, you know, it's more about user education and helping people understand how to research, which is, I'm not going to say an easy thing to do, but outsourcing truth to, you know, a couple of think tanks is, is really not a good idea. Yes. Especially when you look at who, these things things actually are <laughs> quite troubling. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but uh, I'm just look. I was going through all the uh, Atlantic Council videos, you know, which have which nobody's watched, you know, on YouTube. And the same night that they announced their partnership with Facebook, they were honoring George W. Bush with a leadership award, a leadership an, an international leadership award. The same night. The same night that they say that, they, that they're going to be in charge now of determining what's a lie and what's not on Facebook, they're honoring the guy who lied us to war. Anyway, um, right. so here's something that I found um, interesting. You, you said that you actually want uh, Facebook and Google to essentially, um, basically, if they, if they go open source... Obviously, that affects the success, potential success of your company. And yet you say you want that to happen. Please explain that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, that would be the greater good. I, I can't deny that their behavior, their abuses are, across you know, the gamut are helping us grow. Because every privacy violation, every ban, basically everything they do is is feeding alternative sites to grow, not just us. But there's billions of people on those platforms. I mean, that is the infrastructure for the majority of people on the planet for communicating. So the, I, I don't predict that the same thing – we're not going to see another MySpace in the same way. I think that – they're, they're so much bigger and more entwined in everything than MySpace was. So it's going to be a lot harder to extract them. That's not to say it can't happen, but I mean, they, they built some incredible tools. Look, let, let's not, 
lie. They they are they're really smart people working there, incredible developers. They know how to design products. The problem is it's just rotten. Mm. So if they could just address the rot, open source everything, encrypt everything, you know, apologize, change their policy, you know, the the chances of these things happening are pretty much impossible. They, there, there would have to be some sort of a mutiny within the board structure of the company, and it would, it would definitely be a, a ballsy move. But I think that's really the only thing that can actually save them. They're hemorrhaging right now. And you know, the only reason they're staying alive, Facebook, for instance, because they have Instagram. Most people don't even know that Facebook owns Instagram. Mm-hmm. But Instagram is a beautiful product. But it's still rotten, and it's still spying on everybody. So, yeah, if they would switch that, I mean, look, the Instagram founders just left. The WhatsApp founders left because they see that Zuckerberg and friends are selling out all their users. They're destroying what they built, and everyone's pissed. So, sure, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Apple, Microsoft, all, Yahoo, T- Tumblr, all they're all proprietary. Mm-hmm. If any of them went open source and changed their philosophies, it would differentiate them from the pack. And it would give us a code base to build on top of. So what we've had to do and others is sort of build up from the ground and, and almost reinvent the wheel to, to, to get to a competitive state as opposed to if they'd been open source the whole time. We could have built on top of them. We probably would have a much better product. They would have a much better product. But no, they don't care about that. Yeah. Um, you know what? I mean, I love that that mindset. That I mean, you're clearly in it. Uh, yeah. To, to you see a need and you're you want to fill that need. You want to offer a better product. And I I love that mindset over. You know, I just want to dominate the market. I don't care if it's actually making people's lives better. Um, and that really reminds me of uh, Elon Musk and the electric car. You know that what he he constantly was saying that he's like man i wish you know all these big established uh car companies they'd adopt the electric car i I don't care if it would put me out of business that you know then i'll move on to something else that needs uh needs work i remember that what he's what you know he's quasi you know open sourced the patents but i don't I do think that his head is way more in the right place than them, but Tesla is still very proprietary. They didn't just like open source everything. You can't just go and download the code for the operating system running in in Teslas. You can't just go build. uh, So I think that what they did was they said, okay, we're not going to sue you if you come into this market because they they know they know that the market is going to expand and that's going to be good for their business overall if if more people are involved but you know it would be incredible if they if they took that to the next level mhm so how about you know i i've used minds.com i really i think you did a great job designing it um I enjoy it. It's not just uh, you know an alternative Facebook. It's an alternative Facebook, YouTube, Reddit. It's kind of a combination of all three of those. Um, but there's, but even for people who don't care about privacy and free speech, there's actually a lot of great incentives for them to come on to check out Minds.com. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah. So we basically integrated this whole reward system where you earn crypto tokens for the engagement you receive every day and referrals you make and how active you are. And one token equals a thousand impressions. So you can take your tokens and boost your posts for more impressions. There's a little boost button on the bottom of every post. And this really allows anybody to get exposure to their ideas Without even paying, you can just earn it, or you can buy them. Uh, you check out minds.com slash token. It has all the information on how to use them and how you can get them. And this is really what the future of social apps is going to be. I mean, why wouldn't you use apps where you're actually earning something and you can have your ideas heard as opposed to restricted by algorithms? It's sort of a no-brainer. So, you know, we're not I – don't, I don't think that our app is like – fully at the functionality level of like Facebook and Instagram, but we're, we're catching up quickly. I would say in the next, you know, six months to a year, we're going to be 
really close. We just did a, a big funding round and we're going to be able to turn on the afterburner. So, you know, their model is to extract value and just to just slowly like sort of beat you and like see how much you're willing to take, see how much, yeah. see how much you're, yeah. how much can we abuse the customers and have them still stick around? Yeah. That's the, that's the attitude as opposed to, you know, how much can we reward and help creators be successful, you know, earn revenue, earn crypto. So it's just a totally different uh, model. Yeah. Also a very cool function is you can offer uh, tokens to other users to yeah. reach, to share your content. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just, that's actually know. my favorite feature that is still sort of gaining traction, but I think that has a ton of long-term potential, especially as we get a lot bigger brands, more and more joining. Basically I can send you an offer. Any brand can send each other an offer of tokens. And then you get a little notification that says, Hey, Bill's offering you, you know, a hundred tokens to share this post. You accept it or reject it. If you accept it, it gets shared to your followers. It's pure peer to peer advertising. That is the whole underground market that has emerged on other, other networks where pages are going to each other and saying, Hey, I'll pay you for posts on this page. And we just thought that you know, that's so inefficient and you, it's, it's relying on trust. You know, you have pages, PayPaling each other, you know, then you have to get, you know, share your, get the, make sure your posts get shared there. This is fully automated. You don't have to trust the people at all. If you like the content, if you like the channel, bam, it's done. And you can, um, you know, really see that scaling for like the influencer economy or, and realistically, People know and brands know who they want to advertise with. You don't necessarily yes, need to yes. come through. You don't need to come through us. You can come through us. So if you know you just you know want us to target target it for you to our general population, great. Um, but you know, in other circumstances, you know better than we do. Yeah, that, and and that actually reminds me. Um, so yeah, I, I think your advertising features are freaking awesome. I mean, there is an issue at YouTube where, you know, like advertisers will pay to get featured in on on you know, in front of videos, but they don't have a control in many cases on what videos it appears in front of. Um, right. you completely solve that problem, cut out the middleman, and it is and it's important to mention that unlike uh Facebook, you offer a very cheap uh way to avoid all advertising. Right, 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 right. Yeah. If you don't want to see any of it, you can just do mine's plus, which is like five bucks a month. And, you know, to be honest, I keep boosts on basically the way the, the main feed works is it's fully raw and chronological, but like every 15 posts, you see a boost. And I keep it on just because it sort of breaks my echo chamber. So I, I, I like to just see what's coming through because they don't boosts on mine's don't really feel like ads all the time. Sometimes they do, but a lot of times it's just creators putting their content out there. It's not like some car ad. It, it feels much more authentic and real. And it's like, you know, original content a lot of the time. So I keep it on, but yeah, if you don't want to, it's easy to get out. And Facebook doesn't even give you the option to not see it, which is, you know, a lot of people would probably do to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, so I, I really, I, I'm just so excited about this because I really feel like you're taking the best elements of all, you know, all social media sites uh, and all and then fixing all the negatives. Uh, like, you know, I really enjoy Reddit, but they have a, an issue with, um, you know, censorship, too, unfortunately. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, Reddit yeah. has yeah. Reddit has really is interesting because. One thing that they do pretty well, which we are considering phasing in, is is the idea of having community moderation. Like w one thing that is starting to become a bit of a nightmare mm. is, and and there are censorship issues that come along with community yes, moderation. Yes. But the problem is that we actually also don't want to be like the arbiters of what is okay and what is not okay. Mm. So, you know, we still get reports for like, you know, whether it's a copyright issue or, um, you know, a, whatever it is, mm -hmm. some of it is not okay. 
um, inciting violence, which rarely happens, but it does come through. And or just some subjective thing about, you know, what is over the line or not. And I think that bringing in the community is the only way to really scale that as opposed to like what Facebook and Google are doing is hiring thousands of moderators who, you know, go through the content. And it just seems like a more community driven approach to, you know, with still within our policy, like if it's legal, it's, it can stay on the site. But, you know, for instance, if you start a group, Obviously, you should be able to decide what's in that group. Sure, sure. And then we just brought in this new hashtag system so that we have – you can subscribe to – you obviously have your main feed. But you can also subscribe to hashtags and have an alternative feed, which is basically the top content in those hashtags. And it's just a lot of overhead for us and our admins to be going through every single thing. So as my, I'm, we're trying to think of a way that isn't censorship – but allows the community to help us essentially because it's a huge job and maybe we can incentivize that, but you, it's also can be dangerous. So, you know, these are the kind of really complex problems that, that we're trying to solve. Yeah. So no shadow banning or like would, no, yeah. See, that, but that's, I mean, filtering, uh, filtering. Yeah. So you want users to be able to filter their own experience. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, you don't want – like when, when someone signs up, you don't want to just be blasting them with, you know, the most hardcore stuff. Like you, you, you need you, – what we're trying to create is a way for – if people want to see intense content, then they can. But if, when you sign up, it's sort of like as blank as we can, as we can make it. And then depending on your – uh, specific desires, you can you can subscribe to what you want to see. But yeah, obviously no shadow banning. We don't. I mean, you can look at our algorithm. So yeah. we do have filters, but it's it's not shadow banning. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Is there any? Oh, also, like yeah, like, like when I was saying, like what I, the good things about Reddit, like the whole karma thing. I think it's a great idea, but you can't really do anything with karma on Reddit. On mm. Minds, you can actually, you know. You can use that to boost your own content. You, act, I mean, that karma. Yeah, or you can send it to other users. You can subscribe monthly to other users, sort of like a crypto Patreon type model. Creators can set different reward tiers. Um, you can also use the tokens to get plus, mines plus. Um, and the thing is with Reddit, I mean, there was a really interesting story about censorship on Reddit like a few months ago where the CEO was in an AMA. And one user asked him, well, are racists allowed on Reddit? And he said, well, yeah. And then the media, you know, freaked out. Oh, my God. Racists are allowed on Reddit. That can't be possible. And then so then he came through. He, he well, he circled back and clarified his comments. He said, racists are not welcome on Reddit. But see, Huffman and Ohanian and all of the founders of that site – you know, Reddit, it was like, you know, sort of old school troll sp spot. And then it, it changed. But they know that they understand psychology and they know he knows that he can't just go and go around saying that racists are not allowed on Reddit. And but, but he saw the media, he, you know, the media backlash to him saying that. And obviously you don't want, you know, racists suck, but that's not how you deal with racists and that's you know if you're going to have an open platform you have to be willing to you know you can't just say that. That, that that's not what the internet is about and they know that but they're trying to tread that political line and you know it's just it's really interesting how you know as sites grow they get sucked in to uh censoring more and obviously back in the day twitter i mean all that type of content is still on facebook and twitter you know they're they're trying to make it seem like you know they're some sort of uh space with none of that kind of speech even though it's impossible to extract that kind of speech so even just in the last couple of weeks instagram and facebook and twitter were all under fire for you know the amount of racist content on their site the Twitter, the shooter, two shooters ago, I forget what his name was, but he made like a hundred threats on Twitter to legislators 
and Twitter didn't do anything about it the whole time. And then they apologized. So, you know, it's, it's just funny how they're trying to paint the picture as if they're solving this problem, but they're really, you know, not even making a dent in it. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the issue and tendency of these large companies, these social media companies, as they grow, it creates more problems and they, cr- they, they do more censorship. They become uh, more influenced by governments. And that's something that actually, I, I would like to talk about this briefly because I think this is something people don't consider. And that is the fact that, you know, so yeah, Facebook does these, this horribly censors, cracks down on free speech, not just in the U.S., but significantly worse in other countries. And why do they do it? Well, one of the reasons is because these governments could block the site from their country. And so they right. just give in to these demands. Now, so, like, B- Bill, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, uh, what would minds do in this, you and minds do in this situation when, you know, let's say, like, Vietnam or wherever, like, threatens to shut down uh, minds.com because because uh, they don't want anti-establishment uh, voices to have an outlet. I think one ISP in Vietnam already banned us. Wow. And I, you know, go- but but like Google and Facebook aren't, I don't think that they're fully allowed in, in China. So that, you know, that, mm-hmm. that is sort of a bird's eye view of like, wow, you know, imagine a country, you know, censoring even harder than, you know, we think Facebook yeah. and Google censor, <laughs> but actually these countries are even more hardcore. So it's just sort of a, a wake up call. And yeah. um, no, I mean, we're not going to compromise our values to get into China. But then, you know, you do have to ask what is like the question going through, you know, to play devil's advocate, mm-hmm. if you think of like the Google CEO, I forget, uh, uh, like Sergey Brin and Larry Page, like their mindset going into China, they're like, well, it's totally censored in there. People don't have access. It's all about access to information for them. Like there are people within these organizations who do genuinely care about access to information. And so if they say, hmm, do we create a filtered version so that people have more access to information than they did before and sort of, you know, try to get our our, our fingers in? Because the reality, th- that is arguably a net benefit but um you know i i don't i so i don't fully know the answer to that if you know it's worth it to get your your foot in the door um it's it's a big question we're not going to just we're we're not going to censor censor the core of minds.com um and but and and we don't have any plans to do that for other countries um but i i'm open to at least understanding the conversation. Um, and then what was the other part of that question? Um, no, I, I think, I think you, you answered. I mean, I, I just threw, through the, uh, question to you, you know, wh- what would you do in that situation? If a government, if a foreign government, uh, threatened to I- eliminate your site in their country, if you didn't censor content. Yeah, obviously not on that. We, we would not do that. I am curious to understand. I mean, what do you think about that? So say, 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 say a country asked us, they weren't saying uh, censor your site, but they were saying create a filtered version for our country. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> that is not an easy uh, question to answer. It be, and because uh, like you said, they're, you know, maybe you could make a difference if you get your foot in the door um, at some point. It's it. it There's really... also VPNs, too. So, like, you know, just because a site gets censored in a country doesn't mean that people can't access it. So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you still can. There's always going to be ways to to get around it. Mm-hmm. And so maybe that is the, the better strategy to just, you know, uh, say no and then have people you know build technologies that make Mm -hmm. sort of government censorship irrelevant yes Yes. and then and then this is the whole idea of like uncensorability so you know we're as in our current state we're not quote-unquote uncensorable which we're building a prototype so we just launched um something called nomad which is a parallel app 
which is not on our servers, and it uses a combination of Ethereum addresses and what's called the DAT protocol. It's on our GitHub now, and it's fully peer-to-peer, so it's it's not censorable. Um, it's just it's hosted on everyone's machines, and that is really the direction where things need to go. That's really immature. You have to use a, a browser called the Beaker browser in order to access it, but I think you know, browsers like that are going to start getting bigger. And ultimately, this is how the foundation needs to change is, you know, relying on centralized sites, you know, you're, you're still operating within the same general framework, we have to enter a whole new framework of like a peer to peer web where it's not even really a question of if a site is censoring, like we have this more open policy. And, and, where the tech is, this is how we need it to be right now. Because in order to create a, a platform that's at all competitive with Facebook and Google, with mobile apps and, and whatnot, you know, the peer-to-peer tech just isn't advanced enough. But we're going to be investing a lot in advancing it. So hopefully it can mature soon. And then in the meantime, we're creating a more open atmosphere on sort of the old style of hubs. And then you know we can slowly move people into the new, the new web, and it's the, people are calling it Web three. I, I really do, uh, yeah. That like the point you made that you know there are ways to get around government censorship, so you don't necessarily have to um, you know give in to the demands of uh, to the threats of government censorship. Um, I think that's an attractive answer. <laughs> Um, but speaking of uh, censorship on social media, I found it interesting. I was trying to share Minds.com with people on Facebook, and it got blocked in uh, posts, in messages, even if I... So, yeah, they, they give you this CAPTCHA message, so you got to wait like five seconds just to send it to, after you confirm you're not a robot. Maybe you can explain what the hell's going on there, but I also want to point out that even if I've already published a post and I want to edit it and republish it, they make me do the capture again. Very sketchy uh-huh. stuff. So what, is, what do you think is going on there, Bill? I don't know. Um, it's, not, it's not cool, yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. But it's expected. I mean, you know, they're calling us unsecure, which is funny because, you know, pretty sure Facebook got hacked for like <laughs> over over 50 million users pretty recently. Uh, pretty sure we've never been hacked. <laughs> Pretty sure, and you have you encrypted know. messaging. Yeah, so <laughs> unlike them, um, you know we're we're sending a letter. We're gonna see what what we can figure out. Um, you know, it's possible. I, I try not to jump full towards the conspiracy right up front. You know, it's possible that you know we do have referral links for our rewards program, so it's possible that some users were like spamming those onto Facebook. I don't but know. Here's the thing, Bill. If that if that were the case. Uh, and I appreciate you not like jumping into conspiracy mode. I, I hope I didn't come across too much like that. But, no, but, no, yeah. no. It, it's definitely uh, sketchy. Yeah, but here's the thing: if that's the case, if people were uh, individuals were doing that, uh, p- posting tons of uh, minds links, well, then yeah. why wouldn't Facebook just you know eliminate those profiles? Exactly, yeah. eliminate those profiles. Obviously, they have no problem doing that. They've been doing it. Why would you not just do that? They did a similar thing to I don't know if you remember this uh, app that died. It's, it's called Sue T S U. Oh, I'm not familiar. Um, with it. Yeah, no, but like a bunch of years ago, it was sort of a, a, a competitor to Facebook that would pay people sort of a share of, of ad revenue. And I remember their links got blocked. Um, hmm. And so yeah, we're trying to find out. I think you know, there's obviously so, so our pay. We don't even really post on our our page there, but. Yeah, our links got blocked, and so, but we most of our tra- honestly, this is why we built it years ago. And you know, we were running huge pages on Facebook. We saw the reach declining. We saw the surveillance. We knew that it wasn't sustainable, and so we decided to build our own network. You know, I think a, a lot of organizations probably wish they had built their own too. You know, looking back, but you know, Facebook is. They're so good at making you addicted and just making it not seem worth it to build your own. But it's just not worth, you know, whatever your brand is, trusting Facebook for that 
important relationship between you and your audience is just it's just not worth it you you need to control your data and you need to control your audience because it's only going to get worse uh, i i can't see them I can't see them switching because their revenue model, their public company, it now is reliant on surveillance. Yeah. So, because they they've proven the more they surveil, the more that they can predict what you're going to do, the more the uh, ads they can serve. So, um, and yeah, I, I don't see it reversing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, so yeah, in that sense, you know, you're a Facebook alternative, a great Facebook alternative, but not necessarily. Uh, a competitor since you are offering this new product, this, you know, product with actual privacy. So maybe can you take, can we take a minute or two to, to differentiate Minds.com from the other uh, social media alternatives like um, Steemit? Sure. So, I mean, ultimately, I have a thousand times more respect. For, I mean, I consider as long as you're open source, I don't necessarily consider you a competitor. Um, I think that people who are open source, you know, working on decentralized apps, privacy focused, if you're in that world, at least we're on the same philosophical wave. And, you know, likely we can even interoperate moving forward and have some sort of, uh, you know, there's a cool protocol called Activity Pub so that you can sort of work together. But, I mean, Steemit is, they run on their own blockchain, and the more voting, the more Steam you hold, the more voting power you have, which I'm not really sure works too well. The way our system works is everybody's vote is the same, and the, you, the more engagement you receive, the more crypto you earn. So it's not really based on, you know, you don't have more power based on how much money you have which I think is, is tough. And, and Steemit is more of a, a blogging service. Mm -hmm. I think they, they have a video component. Yeah. With like YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. But I think they just, you know, look, I'm not going to sit here and, and hate on mm -hmm. them. I, I think that they're do they're, they're on the, the right path, generally speaking. And there's others who are using Ethereum and using other decentralized protocols, which are, doing interesting stuff. So, it, But if they're proprietary and they're saying that they're an alternative, that's where you really have to raise your eyebrows. Yeah. Because there, <laughs> there, are, there are definitely alternatives that are saying that are doing that very thing. And so you have, you have to be careful there. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I'm not going to hate on Steemit. Uh, I moved on to their, because, you know, they, they, they're not censoring as, I, I don't know if that's even possible <laughs> the way they've got it set up. That's what's attractive about Steemit. But like you mentioned, the fact that uh, they, the more money you have, the more of their cryptocurrency you have, the more power your upvotes get. I mean, that just doesn't that. That's not good. That, especially considering like how. Uh, why the difference is between those who have like tons of money, I guess they call them whales, right? And like newbies, like it's just, it's, it's, that is a big flaw with, with the Steam system. And also I'll say uh, for anybody who has experience with Steam, it, man, uh, it's, it is a bit more complicated. You've got Steam, Steam Power. It's just, it's a bit more complicated too. And I, and I much prefer the minds.com uh, design model. It's, it's, it's much simpler, I think. Um, in addition to being more fair. All right. What, what are any, any points that we haven't hit on that you'd like to hit on? Um, not really. Okay. I just think that, you know, if people care about this kind of stuff, it's really important to just be as active as you can on alternatives because that is what empowers the alternatives. So you have to walk the walk. And it doesn't mean you have to go cold turkey and leave all of the big networks, but... You definitely have to show your support by checking in, being active, posting once in a while, getting your feet wet. It's uh, otherwise nothing is going to change. So that that's all that I can really say. Yeah. So man, uh, let's let's help change things and uh, go over to minds.com. You can see Bill there. Bill, what's your uh, minds.com address? Yeah, it's at Ottman, O T T M A N. And I am at minds at Minds.com at Matt Orff, M-A-T-T-O-R-F. Bill Ottman, thanks so much 
for speaking with me. Thanks for having me. Let's do it again. Awesome. Hopefully. Bye. Good luck. Please hit the like button, leave a comment. Thanks for watching. Matt Orphalia, I guess that's how you pronounce it. YouTuber Matt Orphalia. A YouTuber named uh, Matt uh, Orphala. Wow, somebody knows me. Absolutely, cool. baby. Cool. We watch your videos, we make them go viral. People were enjoying it. All right, let's walk out here.